today on the Passionate Pediatric Dentist Podcast. Correct. And I think it goes back to our theme here, which is people make those decisions based on feelings and emotion that I I think I can afford to give that raise. Um, And they have no mathematical or economic formula. There's no there's no logic behind it. And that's, again, human nature. We're just making those decisions emotionally. And we have to get out of our norm, out of our comfort zone, learn something new, study something we're not used to, learn the numbers, and then we can make wiser decisions. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Passionate Pediatric Dentist. I am your host, Dr. Phil Slonkowski. Thank you for joining us. I just want to say as we continue to um, sit through this COVID-19 pandemic that I really continue to hope and, and pray that this ends soon for all of us. I know it's not easy on so many different levels, but I am I am really continue to be be touched and inspired by all the goodwill that I see out there amongst the pediatric dentists. You know, there's nothing like a crisis that can bring everyone together. And I'm hopeful and encouraged that when this is done, that maybe we'll have an even more deeper united front because, um, you know, the topic of today's podcast is going to be on good financial habits for managing practice cash flow. And all of us out there are going to have to watch the money in our practice tighter than ever before, you know, um, depending on how much of a cash reserve you had will determine how things play out. Um, how the rest of the year goes is going to be determined on how we watch our money. And everyone has a practice at a different state of the game. And I think the topic that uh, we're going to talk about today, um, this was an interview I did with Chris Sands from Profi 2020. I've had him on before. And as I say in this podcast, I think he's my first recurring guest. And Chris and I are going to do a number of podcasts. There's Another one that I'm releasing during this that's going to be on uh, debt and ways you can manage debt. A lot of us are going to have to take on debt to to get through the rest of this year. Hopefully we can have that debt paid off by the end of the year. Um, But no matter what, your practice's health is going to be based on how you manage your cash, how you minimize your debt. And for those of us right now, it's going to be really watching our expenses and our cash flow. And so I think this podcast will serve as just a good review for some healthy principles, some healthy habits that we can all think about because we're going to have lots of time to think right now so that when we come back, when we're back in action here, hopefully in the next month or two, gosh, I hope it's in the next month, that we can start implementing these to make sure that we are able to watch every penny, know where it's going, so that way we can recover from this quicker. And in the end, we'll have a more efficient practice, a leaner practice, which will only meet the demands of what's what's going to be coming. Because um, in my opinion, I think that this is going to throw our economy into quite a, a tizzy. And I think that if you're not already focusing on how to run a financially healthy practice, you need to start thinking that way. Because we don't know what the ramifications of this are going to be on an economic front. And the best defense we have is making sure we have a financially sound practice, that we know where our money's going and that we've got control of that. And this conversation with Chris is, um, I think, a, just a great a great overview of some good healthy habits for knowing how to monitor and, and look at your cash flow. So without further ado, here is uh, Chris Sands from Profi 2020, and him and I having a good conversation about good financial habits for managing your practice cash flow, you know, enjoy. We're continuing our financial discussions and we got Chris Sands back and he teased last time about what we were going to talk about today. And if you remember from the last podcast, we talked a lot about how personal financial habits are key to success. And and in this podcast, Chris is going to dive deep into how we can take those personal habits and translate those into understanding cash flow for our businesses. And, you know, this is the passionate pediatric dentist. So, you know, we're all running dental offices, but if there's one thing I hope some of you have learned, it's that the business principles that we talk about in dentistry are just applications of business principles that take place in the real world. We're all in business. It's, it doesn't matter. We're just applying dentistry to business principles. So I hope you guys can keep that theme 
in the forefront of your mind. So, Chris, how are you today? Awesome, awesome, Phil. Thanks so much for having me back. It's always a pleasure to be on this show. Yeah, thanks for doing this another a second time. You're you're our first uh, official follow up guest, I think. So, can... <laughs> thank you very much. I'm honored. <laughs> Well, just, you know, again, how we understand money is not just a one-sided discussion. You know, there's so many views to take and so many different things. I mean, so I think it's just a, I think if there's a topic where you're going to have multiple discussions, it's going to be about money, right? Because gosh, it, it never goes away. We needed to do business every day. So let's kick off with from where you teased last time and let's start talking about cash flow in your business. Absolutely. Well, you know, I think that one of the, the core principles that we really need to understand about money. You know, you said we all have to deal with money in our everyday lives, but one of the core principles is really that we, we are emotional beings and we like to try to think that we can think logically and make logical decisions, especially around things with money. But uh, if you really pay attention and you really look deep inside your own behaviors, you'll understand that we make emotional decisions. Everyone makes decisions based on emotion. And money, while it hopefully shouldn't be emotional, it absolutely is. It's something that if you look at what's going on, you know, even currently with the fears of the coronavirus and oil changing and the stock market up and down, these are all emotional things that, that occur around us. We, we get to witness it all the time. It's no different on the inside uh, walls of our business. You know, we like to think that we're always making the, the wise decision, the the profitable decision, you know, doing the right thing, but we tend to make decisions emotionally and we actually have to put some guardrails around ourselves and understand that this conversation, while the, just like you said that, you know, we're talking about business or we're talking about dentistry, but it's really about business. We're talking about money and finance, but it's really about behavior. And we have to understand what our natural human behaviors are and what our tendencies are. And so I think that the, the most important thing we can do is realize that, identify it, and put guardrails around it. And so what I want to talk about today is, you know, you really need to understand that your business and the profitability of that business is actually a choice. And if you've ever been in, in the situation where you've thought to yourself, I don't understand, you know, why I, I keep growing, but I'm not really making any more money or I'm not seeing that profit or the, the accountant is telling me that congratulations, you're way more profitable, but I don't see any of that money in my bank account. That's what we're here to talk about and fix. So I think that, you know, over the course, maybe of hopefully I'm a constant repeat attendee or guest on your, on your show. Hopefully over the course of the next maybe few episodes, we can talk about some concepts that are in uh, two great books that I ask every client of ours, we give, give these books to our clients, ask every client of ours to read. And if you're listening, write this down. Those two books are number one, Profit First by Mike Michalowicz. That will certainly change your world. And number, number two, which I think you might have some commentary on, which may be an easier read and a more fun read, Simple Numbers, Straight Talk, Big Profits by Greg Crabtree. Yeah, um, great, I'm gonna, both, I'm, are, both are great books. Yeah, I'm going to echo what you said right out of the gate and say, you know, especially for those listeners, we have a lot of listeners that are associates who are transitioning to ownership. We have a lot of listeners that are one to two years out. And if there is one book that actually, I'm going to say two books, <laughs> both of these books. And I agree with you, Chris, you know, the profit first can be a little bit, uh, I think, overwhelming. I found the simple number by Crabtree, a great one. Like that, that's probably be in my mind, the first one. Tell me if you agree with me. I think that'd be a good one to read first and then read profit first after that one. Totally agree. I would say that the simple numbers book is more relatable, easy to understand, not, not a lot of crazy jargon. Uh, and it's a lot of theory. Profit first is more like mechanics, forced mechanics. They try to back it up with some of some, some data and facts of human behavior. Um, but profit first, will talk more about how you actually implement the stuff in your life. You know, I like how you in your business. I like how you introed into this aspect of human behavior. And I think, you know, if there's one profession that really understands behavior, it's pediatric dentistry because, you know, the art of what we do is manipulating the children's behavior in order to help accomplish treatment. And so, you know, for me that kind of analogy works because you know, the way that we do move money around, it's it's deeply emotional. And it's deeply tied to behavior, and it's very hard to sometimes break those habits. 
And, um, you know, I do a lot of stuff in the health space and I've gone through a lot of really cool experiences lately where I have done over the last three months, what I'm essentially been doing to myself is changing ingrained behavior that goes back decades. And um, it's very difficult to do that. And health and money are two of the the toughest things that we try to turn around. And so I, I really, I like your analogy. I think it's a great one. And I hope people can, can find value in that, knowing that what we're going to try and talk about is how to be successful by changing these behaviors. We can all achieve it, but it's going to take some behavior change and hard work. That's right. And change is not always easy or fun. Most people resist change, but uh, you have to acknowledge the old saying that if you are doing the same thing over and over again or expecting different results. That's the definition of insanity. So it's actually putting some things in place to maybe even force you out of your comfort zone to change this behavior and, and get a different result. And I, I think we, we somewhat maybe even talked about it on the personal finance uh, podcast last time, but piggybacking on your analogy, I couldn't agree with you more that to that manipulating behavior in a positive way to, for the benefit of the, the children that you work with, you know, one of the, one of the hardest things you have to get them to comply with is learning how to floss every single day. And that is no different than what we're going to talk about today. In dentistry, you collect money on a daily basis. Money comes in and gets deposited every single day. Here and there, there are some exceptions, but for the most part, whether you're collecting uh, payments from Medicaid or insurance or your fee-for-service patients, you're collecting money on a daily basis. So one fundamental concept to understand is money likes to move. And it has to be moved on a, at the same frequency when it comes in and needs to be moved around. So committing to daily transfers of getting money out of your main account. And if you have only one bank account, one or maybe two bank accounts, think of it again, back to this flossing analogy that you've got all of this financial bacteria in the form of expenses floating around, waiting to attack, okay, and feed on the money. And they're constantly attacking. And the only way to prevent financial decay in the form of more expenses and debt and cash flow problems is to floss your finances, floss the money out of that main bank account into smaller accounts. And if you go through and read the book Profit First, they talk about a concept of small plate. And that concept has to do with, you know, here, here in the U.S., the average plate size has really, really grown over time. And we all have been brought up with this mentality of, you know, clear your plate because there are starving children around the world. Make sure you finish everything on your plate. And so the result of that is we have obesity problems in the U.S. In other countries, especially European countries, a lot of them will have smaller plates, especially in countries where they have maybe tapas, and they, they have multiple small plates, or they have to go back for a second serving. Well, the act of having to get a separate plate or go back for another serving actually promotes consuming less, and they, they have studies on this that they've found. So the same exact thing has to be applied in, in your business that having small accounts, purposeful accounts, that you're pre-planning for some of your, your known expenses that you have every month and separating those out, but also one of the most important ones, having a separate plate or bank account for profit. And this concept in that book, Profit First, is, you know, pr again, profit is a choice. Traditional business or accounting tells you that revenue minus expenses equals profit. And we actually have to re-engineer that. It needs to be revenue minus profit equals expenses. And if you're not able to make a payment for something, if you're not able to buy something for cash, the truth is you can't afford that thing. And so we have to re reverse engineer our thinking, get the profit off the plate. There's, a, there's another concept known as the primacy effect. And it essentially says that whatever comes first, you will put the most emphasis on. So... In that original equation, revenue comes first. There's a focus on revenue. Well, expenses comes next. So then there's a, some people will just focus on the expenses, and they're not necessarily focused on the revenue enough, but profit comes last. We have to bring that profit first. And this is proven, again, back to studies with even with uh, diet. When we go out to eat, think about when you go out to eat, 
and you go to a restaurant and you get an appetizer and typically the appetizer is something tasty but not healthy and maybe you get your main course and you've got your meat and your potatoes and maybe your vegetable in what order do things get eaten and and what gets left on the plate in most cases the vegetable gets left last but the problem is the vegetable has all the nutrients it's the healthiest thing in in the whole process of that meal and really what we should do is eat the vegetable first so it get so the nutrients do get consumed and studies have shown when you do this you actually curb your metabolism and you will eat less of the rest of the meal and the non-healthy things so this same concept we have to do in the business force the nutrients which is the the profit first as a choice and we will make do with the rest and that make do with the rest concept goes into another law that no one can avoid it's called parkinson's law and parkinson's law states that basically expenses will naturally rise to meet incomes. Or another way of saying it is whatever amount we have of something, we will make do with. And this can be explained relating back to dentistry and relating to back to back to kids and dentistry. You know, if you have a brand new tube of toothpaste, every single day we should be brushing our teeth. All of us do this. We go through this this exercise and you've got your toothbrush and you've got this brand new tube of toothpaste. It's totally full. And you go to put a big glob on the toothbrush and oops, the glob fell into the sink. Well, now you don't want to pick up that nasty glob and use that off the sink. So you just get it. You got plenty more toothpaste in the tube. You just get more toothpaste and use it up. But it's pretty interesting when that tube of toothpaste gets close to empty and how we find all kinds of very interesting ways to make do. And we will squeeze and crank that toothpaste tube. And we will squeeze whatever little drop we can get out of it. And we're, we're able to make it last. And people become very, you know, just ingenuity, I guess is the word. They, they become very creative in how to make it, make it work. And with that, some people will cut off the end of the toothpaste, whatever have you. It's interesting that we can make do no matter what. And that's the point at Parkinson's Law. So if you don't do it this way and you don't reverse engineer, you continue to have that same problem of, you know, I don't feel profitable. I'm, I feel I have these cash flow problems. And you actually have to really force these things upon yourself. So if you like, let's get into, let's get into some of the actual semantics of this. Let me ask you this question. Um, of, sure. Of, of the different offices that you guys have, you know, you guys work with over 300 offices now, right? Correct. These different offices that come to you, what would you say is one of the, you know, you're looking at their numbers. What is one of the biggest problems they have in terms of their numbers? Well, step one is just not knowing your numbers. And I guess, you know, relating it to dentistry again is, you know, they don't have an x-ray. They don't, they don't, they can't see it. And if they do have an x-ray, it's not always a quality x-ray. They don't know how to read that x-ray. So when, I, when I'm using that term x-ray, I really mean, you know, your financial statements. Most of them, because they don't know how to read the financial statement, the only way that they judge the finances of the business is if they have money in the bank account or not. And so they're just, they're doing all of their, their business strategizing just by looking, what money do I have in my bank account? And they can't see the past and, and the patterns. They also can't foresee the future because of that. So they're living in the bank accounts instead of having, you know, meaningful data reported to them. Yeah. And when you're existing in but, that state and you're starting to move money around, it's easy for expenses to outdo what your revenues are. That's and, correct. And I think one of the other biggest things is that it's not necessarily that people are intending to overspend or make mistakes. They're just mismanaging the timing of when they're, when they're spending or moving money. You know, they have money in the bank account and they're like, oh, I can pay this bill right now. And they pay it and they're like, oops, I got payroll coming up in a few days and now I'm short for payroll. Well, let's talk about the, the extra accounts that you should have. I say nine because uh, oftentimes we'll have practices with nine accounts and I'll, I'll go through what those can be. But at minimum, I tell practices to have at least five accounts. Yeah, no, I think that's a good um, place to segue is, you know, let's outline. I mean, the point real quick, the point I wanted to make with that previous question was the fact that I think overall this, the problem that you see repeatedly is because people don't know their numbers they don't know how their money's being spent. And so when I say spending, I don't want people to think that, oh, we just went and bought a Sarek machine. No, by giving your team a raise every time the, you know, the day, like 
other expenses within your office, raises, staff pay, team member pay, things like that can get out of control because you don't know your numbers. And so, you know, like you said, I, if you set the profit bar first and say, hey, here's what our profit is, and we've got this amount of money to work around with everything else, then your decision-making capacity becomes more empowered and better because you're focusing on the profit. That's the, that's in a very simplified version of profit first compared, you know, a, a very simple analogy to profit first, correct? Correct. And I, I think it goes back to our theme here, which is people make those decisions based on feelings and emotion that I, I think I can afford to give that raise. Um, and they have no mathematical or economic formula. There's no, there's no logic behind it. And that's, again, human nature. We're just making those decisions emotionally and we have to get out of our norm, out of our comfort zone, learn something new, study something we're not used to, learn the numbers, and then we can make wiser decisions. Precisely. So yeah, let's go into, you know, people thus far are hearing us talk about multiple accounts and I guarantee a fair number of people listening have just their few different accounts. Can we talk about five, let alone nine? I'd love for you to go through those. Sure. So everyone has a main operating account. So that's your that's your first account. And that's the account where money comes into. And we really want this to be a control account. So as much as we can, we don't want all kinds of automated transfers or ACH drafts being pulled out of that account. You really want to be in control of your money and your cash flow. So the money gets deposited into that main account as it does today for everyone. And then we're going to have these separate smaller accounts that money will, will be put into as, as kind of pre-planned core expense account. The number one you know core expense account is payroll. Okay. So it's your, your people are your most important asset. You got to make sure they're paid on time, never miss a payroll. And payroll is a big number. It's one of your largest expenses every single month. So payroll needs its own separate account. And what you do is you take your monthly total for payroll, find out what you're averaging monthly for total payroll, including the owning doctor, all doctors, all team, the entire payroll, and divide it out by how many days that you're open each month. And the rule of thumb is if you're open four days a week, you're open pretty much 16 days a month. If you're open five days a week, you're open 20 days a month. So divide it out by the number of days. And every single day when money comes in to the main account, the first place you're going to move a daily amount is to payroll. And then I strongly suggest that you tell your payroll company, hey, I have a new bank account number that I want you to pull payroll from. And let the payroll be paid directly out of the payroll account. Okay, so we're getting it off the plate of their main operating account, putting in the payroll account, and then paying payroll out of that account. And again, I don't know if we mentioned this in the last episode or not, but I do strongly suggest that you move to two payrolls a month instead of every two weeks. And we can, that can be a topic for another time. And the next account, you know, one of your other largest uh, variable expenses that does move with the dentistry you do, but is required in order for you to keep doing dentistry is labs and supplies. So labs and supplies, what, find out what your total lab bills are on average each month, what your total supply bills are on average each month, total those two numbers up and divide by the number of days you're open. And you're going you're gonna to put that money there every single day and let it accumulate. I'll talk about in a minute how you, how you use that money and how you pay off those things. Chris, with supplies, that's often a high number for a lot of offices. Do you find that's correct? Do you find that that habit alone, putting it in its separate account, well, in the first step, that actually makes people realize how big of a number that is, and two, does that help them then start having a fixed amount that they then start to work with? Yeah, I mean, I you know, you really have to look at your supplies, and you need to have a budget for this. You need to say, you know, what do we order typically, and why do we order it, how long do we use it, and you've, you've got to become more methodical on you know, your ordering of supplies. Uh, it is one of those variable expenses. If the more dentistry you do, uh, the more supplies you'll order. But you want to have a, a, a feeling on that, and you don't want to be over-ordering. You don't also you want to have a rhythm. That's a big theme here as well is creating a rhythm. But you want to you want to be you're pre-planning. You're over-preparing for these expenses that are required of you every single month. And you said you know supplies is a large one. It is. By the way, let me say this. No. An account does not need to be created if the expense is five thousand dollars a month or less. That's that's one of my kind of rules of thumb. 
But, you know, if you if you take a look at labs plus supplies every single month, labs are typically pretty low in, in pediatric dentistry, but supplies can be high. And as you're growing, that number is going to go up. All these numbers, by the way, they're not static. You create it, and you've got to update this this model periodically. But you're just trying to see, visualize and see this money so that you're not just constantly putting it on a credit card and figuring out how to pay the credit card off. You're pre-planning that expense. It's required of you, okay? Similarly, uh, next account would be marketing. So marketing is one that um, many practices and private practice do not grow fast enough to compete with DSOs. And the biggest difference between them and a DSO is they only reinvest in marketing 1% to 2%, and DSOs are reinvesting 6 to 8%. So challenge yourself to up your game in your marketing but determine what do you spend what do you want to spend as the budget annually on marketing divide that number by 12 and then divide that number by the number of days you're open either 16 or 20 days a month and send an amount to the marketing account and get it out of your main account you're going to notice this pattern like we're trying to make the main account poor every day by the way right when we make the the main account poor you wake up or you look at that account it's got a low amount in it it makes, it makes you not take your foot off the gas. You have to constantly be focused on being productive and growing the business. It actually promotes growth by making yourself poor in your main account. Okay. Account number five is rent and loans. So you should have a fixed rent and you should know what your fixed loan payments are. Total those amounts up, divide them by the number of days, and send that amount there. This is one of the accounts that you can also do an online bill pay from your bank account directly to pay your rent, if that's a transfer to another entity that you own, or if that's a bill pay to your landlord, you can actually send checks from your bank without ever writing a check and have it sent from there. Um, and same thing with your loan payments. Now, if you want your loan payments auto-drafted out of that account, great. But that should be a fixed account, same amount is in it every month, same amount is drafted out of it. Another biggie is an account for CE slash consulting slash travel. Uh, if you're big into growth of your business and you're, you're hiring coaches or consultants or you're taking a lot of CE courses to grow your skill set or your other doctors in your practice skill set, you know, that can be a large annual number. Look historically on what you've spent. Talk about what you want to spend and sign up for for this year or next year. Divide it by 12 months, divide it by the number of days, and put a daily amount in that account. And just let it sit. Those are your core expense accounts, okay? So, again, we had our main, main account where the money comes in, payroll account, lab and supplies, marketing, rent and loans, and then your consulting CE travel account. Beyond that, we're dealing with profit, Okay. So the only expenses that I did not cover in there are your small expenses, your small office expenses. You may have some office supplies here or there. Maybe you're buying birthday cakes for staff. Your generic office expenses, those are going to be small items. Those items will be put most likely on a credit card, and we will pay those items out of the main bank account. Okay? Uh, let me talk about the semantics real quick. If you're using a credit card, I do suggest one or maximum two cards in the business. And if you use, for example, I, I'm, I like to use American Express for their Sky Miles benefits. If you use a, a card like, like American Express, you can link multiple bank accounts. I think it's four or five maximum, but you can link multiple bank accounts to that one credit card, and you can make payments separately from each of those bank accounts. Personally, that's the way I like to do it. In, in the accounts, I would ha you have your main operating account linked to the credit card. Your lab and supply bills are typically can be paid on a credit card, so that's linked to the card. If, if your lab or supply company does not take card, by the way, you can do a bill pay check out of your online banking. See, I don't like to write a lot of physical checks. So as much of an electronic paper trail as we can create, the better. The marketing money, that also typically the marketing efforts we paid on the credit card. And then that consulting CE travel account would also be paid on the card. And you don't have to go through your credit card statement and say, okay, how much was lab and supplies? How much was marketing? You literally just start with these accounts in order from, from the top. You start with the lab and supply account. You pretty much empty the account and pay that much on the card. 
And then you go to the marketing account and you pay that much on the card. And then you go to the consulting account, pay that much on the card. And anything left over should be very de minimis. And that's going to be your small items that were non-clinical office expenses. You pay that out of the main operating. And you can pay your credit card off weekly. You can pay it off as frequently as you like. But I certainly suggest you don't pay your credit card off just once a month. We want to break these things down into smaller numbers, smaller, more manageable numbers. When you see that you have a daily amount due for these things, it makes it easier easier for you to accomplish instead of seeing a huge, large monthly amount. Um, okay, beyond those core expense accounts, we get into the profit. And there are three things that we have to focus on of what to do with the profit. Number one, how much of this profit do we want to save in cash in the business to prepare for the future so that we don't have to go into debt? So if you're working on getting out of debt, phase one is getting out of debt. Phase two actually has to happen simultaneously, stay out of debt. And that requires you saving some cash. So ask yourself, how long is it before my x-ray machine is going to be obsolete and I'm going to have to pay you know, a six-figure amount for an x-ray machine? If you think that's five years out, What's that cost today? If it costs 150,000 bucks divided by five years, that's 30,000 a year divided by 12 months, that's 2,500 a month. You know, divide that by 20 days, and you're talking about maybe what $200 a day. Start putting $200 a day away for five years, and you'll have your money in cash to buy that machine. So, pre-saving, we like to call that account major purchase, and that's just a generic name. One thing that's important about these accounts, the more specific they are, the better. So major purchase is a generic savings account. If you have a, a, an identified goal like that x-ray machine, call it x-ray machine. If you're having trouble getting over the fear of hiring an associate doctor, call it associate doctor so that you see you're able to save up you know, six months of compensation for that doctor. And then the last two accounts are married to each other. Okay, and hear me on this. One is the profit and profit distributions. And again, we do want to ask or force ourselves, ask ourselves how much profit is our goal? What, what has our profit been historically? How much would we like to, to uh, improve that? And we're going to automate an amount to that profit account. And I'm, I told you the expense accounts first, but the truth is the profit account is going to be an automated bill. And that's really the one that's going to be forced the most frequently and it's going to come out first. So we will we will, we'd say okay if we wanted to save you know twenty thousand a month into the profit account, and we were open twenty days a month, we need to put a thousand dollars a day into that profit account, and it's automated and it becomes a bill. It, it should be more important to you than your rent payment. It should be more important to you than your loan payment. Put yourself first, okay. Then you get you get the decision to do I want to take that profit home, and if I do, if I'm going to distribute it out of the business before it leaves the business, we need to filter the tax. I do advise that everyone keeps their tax account for the business inside the business. Don't pay your tax account, you know, in your personal bank account. A great reason for that is that your accountant will be able to see how much you've made in in estimated tax payments to the IRS. And you can just track this. You can break out your total distributions of how much that profit came home to you and how much had to be paid in taxes. But I think of it this way. We save up the money in the profit account the entire month. And maybe once a month or twice a month, the owner is rewarded for having that profit and you can take it home. But before you take it home, if you were going to take, let's say, easy math, $10,000 home, you don't get to take the full 10000 home and spend it. You have to set aside and live by the 40% rule, set aside 40% for taxes. So $4,000 would, would move from the profit distribution account to the tax account, and $6,000 would come home as your after-tax portion that you can spend or save freely personally. Does that make sense? I think that's a, that's a great habit because the, what, you're, what you're identifying is that one of the problems – that business owners get into is they spend money and forget about taxes. That happens, happens more than we'd like to admit. And so by being disciplined about keeping that in a separate account and being cognizant of that, it prevents that from happening. That's right. My golden rule, never 
never, ever, ever take home pre-tax dollars. Never. Because I'm in battle with human behavior and I'm in battle with Parkinson's law. And if you take home pre-tax money where you did not withhold the tax from yourself, you will spend it. It will get consumed. Then you will get a tax bill and a tax surprise and you'll wonder why. And if you were ever an employee first, you know that when you got a paycheck, the taxes were withheld from your paycheck and you spent the rest. Whatever was on that paycheck, you spent it, you saved it, you dealt with it personally, but the taxes had already been withheld from you. As a business owner, why should those rules change? And that's what happens. Business owners will take the liberty and, and just start transferring money home as it's needed. And you always have to think of the, the business like it's in its own bubble and it has a little filter that it has to pass through before money can leave that bubble and come to you personally. And that filter is that tax account. And so if you're taking a, a W-2 paycheck home as, as an owner, that's already done for you using your payroll service. But if you're taking home distributions or draws, whether you're a Schedule C, an S corporation, or in a partnership, you've got to prevent yourself from spending the gross amount. You've got to think of, I need X amount of dollars at home. Or think of it two ways. Our first example, $10,000 I want to take out of the business. I need to filter out and set aside 40% taxes. I get to spend the 60% after tax. The other way of thinking about it is how much money do I need personally at home? You know, maybe I have to replace my gutters or something like that. Let's say I need $10,000 at home. Well, that $10,000 represents the after tax needed 60%. So I need to take do a little math. $10,000 divided by 0.6 equals $16,667. So $16,667 is the gross amount needed. I need to set aside $6,667 for taxes in order to take $10,000 home. If you will at least do this, you'll be so far ahead of the curve as far as avoiding tax surprises because you will be over-preparing for taxes. And if you will, in those first three quarters of the year, that tax account, it's accumulating, okay? It's accumulating every month. And every three months, you know, every quarter, you have to make estimated payments. I tell my clients, empty the tax account. Beat the CPA. If the CPA says, hey, you need to send in a quarterly estimated tax payment of $30,000, but in your tax account, you've accumulated 40,000, send in the 40. Over, send in more the first two or three quarters. And then in the, in the fourth quarter, you would have had your tax planning and all of your tax deductions for that year would have been applied. And they would have done the math on what you've already sent in. And hopefully there's very little due in the fourth quarter or maybe none at all. And I still want you to set that money aside in that tax account. And then you get this surprise, this great advice. It's the best thing we ever get to deliver. It's like, hey, guess what? You don't owe any more taxes for this for this calendar year. What you've set aside in your tax account, you can go ahead and take it home if you want. You can save it. You can spend it. You can leave it in the business if you like, but you're not going to have to pay use it for taxes. And that's some of the, the most relieving, best conversations we can ever have. Yeah, It doesn't a, happen that often. That's a job well done. Exactly. It doesn't. And that's where, you know, I guess, look, that's what I want to highlight is let people recognize, look, this happens all the time. And when we talk about having a better work-life balance, when we talk about decreasing stress, decreasing the amount of decisions you have to make in a given day and given week, month in your life is going to decrease your stress. So um, that's right. Hands down. Can I say this still? So sure. also, some people listening to this will be thinking to themselves, oh my gosh, you know, nine accounts, that sounds more stressful, like it's more to manage. I want to reiterate, the way that you're operating now is giving you your current results. And this feels out of the norm. It's a, it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's non-conventional. And you may be putting up all kinds of objections in your head of, oh my gosh, like, is my bank going to let me have those accounts? Well, with the right conversation, the bank will. These don't have to all be checking accounts. They can pretty much almost all of them be savings accounts, except for your main operating. And does this create an additional chaos in the monthly accounting and reconciling of accounts? It creates a little bit of extra legwork, but it's not chaos if you if you know what you're doing. All of our people are trained this way. 
it is, it is, again, we are modifying human behavior and making it easier to see the money on a more frequent basis. The more frequently you will floss, the more preventative you will be against decay. I've never had a cavity to date in my life. Part of that might be genetics, but I'm just one of those people that they said floss every day and you'll have less pain, less, less cost, and I've done it from day one. And it's given me that result. And so being preventative in your entire life, if you believe in that for your patients, you know, the people on the listening to this are patients of mine. They are business owners and they need to believe in that preventative care maintenance of their cash flow the same way. I love the level of passion you share with us. It's great. So you said there were nine accounts. I think we've gotten up to eight. As we kind of wrap up uh, this podcast, what's the ninth account? So I think I covered it, but let me let me repeat them again. So I like to think of them from the top down. I think of all the money flowing in as, as like water going through a filtration system. And we have to filter through the expenses to get to the profit. So let's start at the top again. Account number one, main operating, everybody already has that. Account number two, payroll. Account number three, labs and supplies. Account number four, marketing. Account five, rent and loan. Account number six, consulting, CE, travel. Account number seven, major purchases, savings account for future capital expenses. Account number eight, profit distributions. And account number nine, taxes. Oh, see, you were talking about taxes. I was going down my list and I, I, I got so distracted by your passionate appeal towards taxes that I did not write nine taxes down on my sheet here. So there you have it, the nine accounts. Those make total sense to me. And I, you know, you and I have had many conversations and I, I think that every time I hear you speak this, it continues to resonate with me. And I, I hope it resonates with our listeners because this to me seems beyond common sense and helps you see, you know, when you're looking at your accounts and you maybe have three or even just one, it's a huge number. And you can look at that huge six-figure number and be like, oh, I'm fine. <laughs> We're good. Until you realize that you have a $30,000 or $50,000 payroll if you've got a huge team. You've got lab supplies about ten, fifteen thousand 15000 marketing. I mean, all of a sudden, that money dries up, not to mention your doctor pay. And so I really love how you break that down, Chris. I really do. I just want to tell you, I think that's a, a great way to look at it. I love it. Yeah, thank you so much. Make sure you know that, like you said, that that main operating account with a lot of money in it, that can be a false sense of security, and you just don't see you know expenses coming coming next. You know, Phil, if you don't mind, I want to give it a shameless plug. You know, we are going through this month. Our, you know, our name is ProFi 2020, and I thought it was fitting that in the year 2020, Pro also kind of being short for profit, Phi being short for first. We are getting Profit First certified in 2020 to be a Profit First professional certified organization as a dental CPA firm. And if you have any other questions with this, we live it in our business. And it's the only way that we're able to coach it to our clients. Please feel free to reach out to our company. You can reach us online, Profi2020.com. And check us out on uh, social media at Profi 2020. So with that being said, man, and you can plug anything you want, because I love everything you're doing. I think the message you guys are spreading needs to happen, because the only way that these dental offices, these dental teams are going to be able to meet the demands of a changing business culture. And I, I look at DSOs as a moving force of business culture, separate from its own sort of influence in dentistry. It's all about business. You know, if you want to beat it, you got to know your numbers, know how to run a smart business. But that doesn't matter if you're doing dentistry. You can be in another business and the same rules apply. So if you want to be successful at a business and you're a dentist, you should stick with dentistry, which is what you're good at. So learn how to run that business. Because if you can't run your dental office, you won't probably be successful running another business. Maybe not. If that's not your passion, you know, you, you got to stick with what you're passionate about. But knowing your numbers, no matter what you're doing, is key. So you know, last time I'd let you tease what the next podcast is. So in that tradition, I want you to uh, tease what our next conversation is going to be about. You know, I, I think where we need to go next is what we've just kind of started on and built in the foundation is we've been talking about cash flow planning. First, we talked about it on the personal side because you got to get that right first in order to fix the business. Today, we covered a lot of the semantics of business cash flow planning. 
one of the next things we need to talk about is debt and how do we have a plan around debt in the business? How do we use this cash flow plan right here to pay extra down on our debt and eradicate it from our business? And understanding that debt is actually also creating the byproduct of phantom tax in your business. That means tax that you owe each year that you're not taking home. And that's one of the reasons that people have the feeling, they have that conversation with the accountant to say, you know, say, hey, great job, you were this profitable. And you're like, why did I not have that money in my bank account or take that money home? Where did it all go? And debt is a big byproduct of that. Chris, I, so couldn't I think we should dive into that next. I couldn't have scripted that better myself. One of the questions that uh, came up in our boot camp, and, and it was great having you at our last boot camp. I forgot to mention at the beginning. You know, think that was awesome getting a chance to do a little session with you. But one of the questions that came up was this idea of what's phantom tax. I'd never heard of that before. And uh, I remember saying, look, go back, ask your account what phantom tax is so you know what that is. Because that's and, really and coming, important. Well, let me, let me give a disclaimer. Coming from an accounting firm, that is not a technical firm or a technical term. And I, it's, it's a term to be used to help people understand it. I've gotten into arguments with other accounting professionals because they say you know, that, that can be misleading to use the word phantom tax because they're thinking in accounting terms of phantom income. If you go through profit first, the, one of the first things you're going to learn is this is very difficult. And I think they also say this in the uh, simple numbers book. This is very difficult to explain to your accountant and they will resist you on it and fight you on it. They don't, they don't get it. We're, we're talking about the behavior of business and how the money really works. We're not talking in accounting terms, but it's, it's extra tax that you pay. doesn't come home. You didn't, you didn't get to enjoy that money, but you owe tax on it. And that kind of stinks. And eradicating that from your business is liberating. It's so one I of those, can't wait to talk about it on the next episode. Yeah, it's another one of those emotional levers you can pull and get rid of so you decrease your stress and make find that financial peace. You and I are both Dave Ramsey fans. So, you know, again, finding that financial peace is really key. So, Chris, as always, these continue to be not only engaging, but just com- complete knowledge bombs of, of so much information. So, um, you've given me more than enough to chew on as well as our listeners. And this was just done in hopefully a, a good 30 minute chunk that everybody can digest with already an assignment. So you're going to, everybody's going to go home. They're going to assess their business and create their five to nine accounts and hopefully start on this path. And, uh, again, Chris, thanks so much. And I look forward to our next conversation about debt. Thank you, Phil. Can't wait. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Passionate Pediatric Dentist. If you took away one pearl, one nugget that's helping you practice better with more confidence, then we've done our job. And if you can, please leave us a review, leave us a comment. It would mean the world to us. Now, this podcast was brought to you by Pediatric Dental Directions. And if you want to join a group of like-minded pediatric dentists who share the same mission and vision as you as what we try to embody in this podcast, then please check us out at www.pddx.us. We have a lot of information. We run a few courses and we would love for you to check us out and be a part of that if you feel that we can be of help, be of value in your journey in pediatric dentistry. And as always, shoot us an email, ask us questions, and we would be happy to answer them either directly or maybe it's going to be a topic we can put for a podcast. But Either way, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, anything worth doing is worth doing well and to the best of your ability. And we are here to support one another. That is the goal of the Passionate Pediatric Dentist. And again, we thank you for joining us. Until next time, take care.